The reason why we added the debt is if we have smaller balances and small can be relative when you're talking about a hundred million dollar fund, but definitely want the ability to monetize those balances. And, and we come across opportunities all the time. Just Tim is one of the most authentic and genuine people I've ever met. I sincerely believe he's coming from a position of giving and that means a lot. You're going to make huge progress. Welcome everyone to today's to hero capital raising show. I'm your host, Tim. I. Today, I have a good friend I've known for a while. I get to watch his growth from killing it in the single family home space, uh, transitioning to the multi uh, family syndications, and now starting a fund that he's raising a hundred million dollars for. It's a hundred million dollar fund. Um, and so, super happy to uh, interview uh, Mr. Chris Bounds on this line today. Uh, Chris is a, a top leader in EXP Realty has done over $90 million in transaction, is the founder of InvestX, uh, which is a community and education platform. Chris and his wife, Jamie, has used over $19 million in private um, money uh, from private lenders to flip and uh, to buy and flip over 200 single family homes. And since then, like I mentioned, has, you know, has done quite a bit. It has over 900 total units between the single family home and the multifamily home, about 740 units of multifamily, uh, has uh, over $77 million asset in the management um, um, already. And with that, let's give Chris a big welcome, y'all. Thanks All right, for having Chris. me, Tim. Yeah. Share with us a little bit about you, what got you started in this multifamily, and then especially what had you started what had you decided to start a fund? Yeah, and, and this whole format you've got going on, I've just been sitting in the background watching what you're doing. This is cool. And to get 58 people, 50, 59, 60 now, the day after Thanksgiving or the day after Christmas, that's a good job. So multifamily, Thanks. like my wife and I, we did 200 flips or so, maybe a little bit less at the time when this whole thought process has been going in my, through my head. But I've been watching other folks some friends of mine, mutual friends, people go up and go into different asset classes, multifamily, short-term rentals, self-storage, mobile home parks, private money lending, just various things. And most of them got started in single family. And I'm over here laser focused on house flipping. And <laughs> My wife and I, we realized like, hey, this house flipping thing. Yeah, it's cool, but it's a job now. Like it's a job and there's really, there's nothing passive about it. Like the moment we stop doing the activity, we stop getting the results from the activity, i.e. money. So we must keep doing that. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it really wasn't why we got in real estate to begin with. We got into real estate to build wealth and passive income. And house flipping was not that solution. It was the solution to help me quit my job and go full time. Achieve, I achieved that. But that was many years before. And here we are, we built this like house flipping machine. So what what do we do? So we started winding down the house flipping and moving over into more buy and holds. It was originally single family and then having more conversations with folks that have gone into other asset classes and just really the bug was there, but we still were focused on single family. Just that's what I knew. And it really came down to a point to where COVID happened. I decided, hey, look, I'm just going to shut off this whole flipping thing altogether. We'll just hold. Those have been our best deals anyway. And then it was just like perfect storm of events where we're no longer flipping. We know where we want to go in the long-term hold. And then a buddy of ours, it was in a mastermind. He, at the most recent mastermind, he said, house flipping has made me millions. I'm thankful. And I'm shutting my business down. And then he went on to say everything that my wife and I were thinking that it was a job it didn't, it wasn't building wealth outside of just the cash per deal. There was no long-term value of the business and he was moving everything over into multifamily and self-storage units. He was doing both of those. And we were like, wow. And then it was probably about 12 months after that same guy had a deal, a very good deal that came across our desk or, or he brought it to us. He was like, Hey, look, we're doing this deal. Do you want to come along with us? And our, and meanwhile, our private lenders, we were churning their money three or four times a year. And house holding. We just in and out. They're making lots of money. Now we're not. And they're like, hey, when's your next deal? I'm like, well, I'm just not buying as many houses. And, but we, now we had this deal. We had this opportunity. It was 300, 380, 
387 units, something like that, 380 units in Daytona Beach, Florida. And it was class B and it was a repositioning play. And the operator had 40 years of experience and they owned a thousand wow. units locally. And then we had the opportunity to come in 50, 50 with them on this deal that they already owned wow. re repositioning capital. I'm like, all right, I don't have to worry about them being new and making newbie mistakes. It'd been in business for 40 years. I trust the guy who brought me the deal. So his money is in it. His partner's money is in it. And then at the same time, like I'm looking for something new. And then my investors are also looking to keep their money to work. So all these little things came into play, started a fund. It was the first, it was a fund of a fund structure, worked out really well. We had a lot of tailwinds too with the market too. So that added some cherries on top of the deal. And that was our first one. It went really well and it gave the clarity on where we wanted to go forward, which is where we're at now. Wow. And how long ago was that? That investment was 20, 2020. And then okay. it was a five-year plan. It lasted 18 months or maybe 16 <laughs> months. So we achieved five years of results in 18 months. Again, that's just nice. market tailwinds. We didn't do anything special right. there. It was a good deal when we bought it. It would have been a good deal had we held it. It just became a an amazing deal just because the market tailwinds take it. Like when that happens, take it. Don't bet on that, but definitely take it. So we did. That's awesome. Yeah. And then, so that was an SPB fund and now you're doing a traditional fund, correct? So yeah, share it's, with a, the... it's a little different than what you see normally. So I had to go back out and, Hey, look, if I'm going to do this, how am I going to add value? I don't want to do the same. I don't necessarily want to do the same thing that everybody's doing. I used to ask this when I was heavy into house flipping. I was like, raise your hand. If you can offer all cash and clothes in seven days, like everyone's hands going up. And I was like, all right, how are you different? How are any of you different when you're talking to a seller? Like you can all, you, everyone can offer that. Differentiate, differentiate yourself. So how am I going to approach the marketplace a little bit differently? Do I, really, do I want to go out and find these deals? There are people who've got even newer folks in the market. They've got five, seven, 10 plus years experience mm -hmm. with bro broker relations on me. Do I want to go into that? Hmm, maybe not. I can do that, but that doesn't, I don't want that to be my differentiator. Do I want to go in and, and be the property manager? Hard no, like definitely don't want to do that. I'm not a construction guy, um, but I have raised 19 million over the years and I've got a perfect track record with my capital partners, both private money lenders and equity partners over the years. I was like, why don't I combine my experience with that and also asset management and planning and also in some um, circumstances, boots on the ground, observation and due diligence. So that's what I pieced together with an open-ended fund that looks and feels a lot like a REIT, what you would see with a traditional REIT, but it's still private equity. It's 506C. So we can provide our investors with consistency, with a consistent blended investment portfolio, a risk-adjusted blended right. investment portfolio targeting workforce housing. Your, your internet, uh, I don't know if it's mine or yours, but it went out for a little bit there. Say that again, and we'll edit our audio correctly, the last sentence about you wanted to give your investors? Yeah, we're, we're just giving our, our investors a risk-adjusted blended portfolio opportunity, targeting workforce housing. Being an open-ended fund, we have the ability to do certain things that your typical syndication, which is closed ended you're just not able to do. I gotcha. So let's talk about your funds. Share with us. So we got the big a little bit of the big picture view, but let's share with us some of the actual structure of it. And then your investment thesis in terms of the type of assets you're going after and the type of investments you're going after. Yeah, it's an open-ended 506C, 100, $100 million total raise as far as type of assets. So workforce housing, which we, we define that as the median income, meaning a certain percentage of the average rents. It, as long as it fits that little, that box, it doesn't necessarily have to be like affordable housing or subsidized housing by no means. Those can be included, but the one we're do, we just closed on in San Antonio, 327 units, class A. It's a class A property in San Antonio because of the, it has some certain parameters that does have some affordable how, um, in it, then that actually classifies as a workforce housing the way we've defined it. So we're targeting workforce housing assets, both debt and equity. Equity is the primary focus. Debt's more on the short term, like gap funding, gap loans, hard money loans. Otherwise, <laughs> equity is the, it's the bigger focus. 
it's just we're much more cautious on who we partner with for, from a long-term perspective. Right. And that's been my I see. caution with folks for years. And, and I'm sure you're, you're the same way. It's when you get in this business, there's, there's a lot of people think single family and multifamily are the same thing. And, and in some instances, there's a lot of similarities, but it's a business and there's a lot of moving parts in the, when you're buying a business, when you're getting a multifamily, you're buying a business and right. you don't know what you don't know. And the problem with multifamily is the things that you don't know that cost you can cost you big. And if you don't have the foresight to uh, mitigate those risks in advance, it's not that you can't, may not be able to traverse through, through those rough waters. You may not have the time. You may not have the time or you may not have the liquidity and definitely the experience. And at the end of the day, like that can be a painful lesson to learn. So we focus on experienced operators and partnering with them to provide them with the equity that they need to get good deals. A little bit, not quite as strict on the short-term gap funding, but definitely on the equity funding, we're pretty strict on who we partner with. I see. And just for clarification, would mobile home parks be... Yes. Yeah, it, it's pretty much any popular. residential housing, not luxury, but pretty much. So single family, multifamily, and mobile home parks. Multifamily is the primary focus. Gotcha. Not really too excited about single family. We have one single family in the fund. I just, I, I had a rental that probably would have sold, but it made sense for the fund as far as the returns it was producing. And it has long-term benefits. So we seeded that into the fund. But for, by and large, multi multifamily is the primary focus, but Mobile home parks, I just haven't looked, I haven't been looking for those type of opportunities, but we both know people who are doing really well in mobile home parks. I'm interested. I just haven't really been looking at them. So let's, I, I really want to focus our interview today a lot around fun. So I, I'm going to ask you questions just to dive deeper into this yeah. whole fun war. Um, and what have you decided that you're going to make your funds not only focus in actual acquisition and um, as well as an L, I guess you come in at a, a somewhat of a uh, GP position. Some you come in as an LP position. Some you come in as a debt lender. Like what have you decided to to do all of those things versus just one specific strategy? Yeah, we are doing one. If you want to consider debt a completely separate strategy, then you can say two. The reason why we added the debt is if we have smaller balances and small can be relative when you're talking about a hundred million dollar fund, but definitely want the ability to monetize those balances. And, and we come across opportunities all the time. Just, Hey, I need a hundred thousand dollars. I need $500,000. I need 1.5 million for the next 30 days, 60 days, whatever. We want to be able to keep the returns going, not just have it sitting there in the bank. But the, the reason why we structured it the way we did is for going after GP position. I'm not necessarily, you talk about LP and GP, which really in legal documents, we're just really like class A, class B. It's not really GP, LP, but keeping, since most people know what we're talking about, the, the fund is structured in a way where we're always in a GP position. And if we're in an LP position, we're in both. And, and there's two really I important understand. reasons. So if, if you're doing a fund of a fund or thinking about doing a fund of a fund structure, there and you do not have a broker dealer license, and or you're not a registered investment advisor. And, and this is not legal advice. This is just paying lots of money to get legal advice. You have to thread a lot of needles. So th there's all these laws. You got federal laws, security laws. You got state security laws. So there's a, you're really trying to thread these needles. And Reg D is an exemption. It's a certain exemption that you're following on. Hey, you do these things and you don't have to register with the SEC. And, and again, this is just how I understand what attorneys have explained to me, whatever it, but the other thing with broker dealer and RA, there's a lot of complications and th there's a lot of ways that I see these deals pitched to me. I'm like, I don't know if that's compliant. I just want to make sure I'm compliant where I'm going with it is I don't get anything above and beyond my fund. Everything is enjoyed within the fund. I don't get any kickbacks. It's not that I couldn't, you can generally do a lot of things as long as it's disclosed properly in your legal documents, but it, it is important to make sure that you're compliant with broker deal and RIA because those can be pretty costly penalties if if you're not compliant and something happens and then the SEC is all over you. So we thread that needle very carefully and make sure, making sure we're following the proper exemptions or we're exempt properly, which includes, I just don't get any kickbacks. That's why we sit on both sides. 
if we're going to be in LP, we're also in the GP. Cannot be passive. And that's just because I'm not a registered investment advisor. If you are, hey, you can do things differently. And, and I've talked with folks who they've gone that, down that path. You just typically either want to be an RIA or you don't. And, and this may be a little too high level on what most folks would be interested in. But I do encourage anyone that's interested in fund of a fund structure where you're investing in other people's deals. You have to understand these are the questions you want to ask a securities attorney because it, you just want to make sure you're compliant. The SEC doesn't care if you're a billionaire, if you're a millionaire, or you just got started and you're trying to grind it out. Like they're going to come down with, they will absolutely come down on you like a hammer if you violate these things. Gotcha. Yeah. And I was going to ask you on that. Um, yeah. So I'm glad you mentioned that you are in both the GP and the LP position. You're always in the GP in your investments. Because I was going to ask you about, uh, do you have that 99 investor limit? In which case, because you're a GP, you don't have that limit. The exemption, and I have to look it up real quick here. The exemption that I'm referring to is called a uh, 3C1 that, that does have a 99 investor exemption, which is my fund. My fund is a fund of funds where we only come in as an LP. We do not come in as a GP. And so we do have a limit of 99 investors. And that's the reason why our fund caps off at $10 million. We figure $100,000 investment times 99 investors. That's almost a million dollars there. And so that's why we go that route. Uh, but uh, in your case, yeah, I think you're probably using a, a 3C. Are you familiar with that? No, uh, your, my attention investment to detail, is it that fine-tuned? I just need to know, hey, do this, don't do this. And <laughs> sometimes I'll retain like 506B, 506C, whatever. But I, uh, yeah, I don't know that. The 99 investor limit, I am very aware of that because $100 million fund, unless you're taking big checks, then you're going to hit that at some point. So that is out there for right. me. That's a problem I will have to solve. I've had very limited conversations. Hey, what are some things? And, and they've given me some advice on that. It's just, it, it's not a problem I have to solve immediately. At the end of the day, I, who knows? Maybe I raise 30 million and have to start another fund just to stay below that. I'll figure that out. Okay. So your fund does have that limitation? Is that what you're saying? And it does have I don't, the I don't, I don't know that the limit. fund itself necessarily has the limitation. It's just what exemption are you taking? And are you going to be able to make that exemption? Uh, so you go in, into 100 investors, do you have to file some other form? And I was just having this conversation last week regarding this our San Antonio deal. I'm like, hey, look, that's our, that's the deal we just closed. We've done these other deals. We have, there's certain requirements that I have to do annual audits. So I'm like, hey, look, this, this, and this, what do you think? And then they're like, hey, our opinion is this, and we think you, you should be okay. And then they checked with the other attorney just to get their feedback. Because there's there's multiple laws. They, they were checking with their SEC attorney, and then there's the attorney on broker-dealer, registered investment advisor, so both of them have their expertise and they're both making sure they're both on the same page and their opinion of it. And that way I I can sleep knowing that, hey, look, I'm legit. Everything's above board and as it should be. Gotcha. Um, in Oh gosh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Having a fund is more complicated, like what you just mentioned. You have to check with the SEC attorney and you got to check with the broker dealer attorney. It sounds more way more complicated than the code GP model. Uh, why didn't you just go with the code GP model? The, the problem I, mean, I, I why, have with that is from your perspective. I my perspective, most people are doing that in a very gray at best to non-compliant, meaning they're getting equity and they're raising money. Like my understanding, that's no go. Can't do it unless you're a broker dealer. Like if you're bringing a, a check or you're bringing investors and you're getting equity, you're getting any compensation whatsoever, it's my understanding that is a direct violation. You just can't do it. And the penalties are pretty severe. At the end of the day, like who's going to find out, right? I don't know. I just don't want that to happen. Someone were to find out, maybe an investor just isn't happy. And then they go have their attorney dig through the documents and then start suing and getting... You know, all these subpoenas and then I realize, hey, look, this happened. Well, darn it. I'm screwed. I'm, I'm 41 years old. I've got two other lifetimes. I've got another 80 years that I would like to be doing this stuff. And beyond that, I don't want to screw my investors. Like I need to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing and getting the advice that the, the legal advice to do it properly. So that's why I didn't go that route. Like I, there are ways 
you can do that where it's above board. You just need to have some, my understanding, some sort of substantial interest in the operations of the company, which can be asset management, property management, due diligence, legal, tax, if, if, if you have those technical skills, property management, boots on the ground. There's a lot of different things you could probably do and, and argue to, to make sure that you're compliant with that. But you're still also limited to a deal by deal basis. So that's another thing. That's I'm an open-ended fund. I'm not I'm not limited to a deal by deal basis. I can raise money in perpetuity. So explain that. So what is a what's the difference between a closed-ended fund versus an open-ended fund? And yeah, let's start yeah. there. You You'll so in short, closed-ended fund, once that window, which can be pretty flexible of fundraising, say, say 5 million bucks. You've got a window that you're going to raise. And once that window's closed, you really can't bring any more money in, at least from an equity standpoint. This is my understanding. Again, not a lawyer. But you also, it's really difficult to get money out because you can't get any new money in. It's going to be hard to get money out like an investor wants to get out unless you're going to buy out their interest. With an open-ended fund, and also your ability to advertise that fund with people you have a connection with, or in the case of a 506C, more, more publicly, then it's limited to that window. Like, I don't have those restrictions. I can advertise in perpetuity because there's no benign fund. I, I'm always raising money. I always have the ability to take on investors. So I had a text right before this call. Someone's doing the invest accredited investor verification so they can get the wire in before the end of the year. I can always take money. It's not a deal by deal basis. And then beyond that, the benefits to the investors are that they're getting a blended, a risk-adjusted portfolio than an individual asset. So ultimately, my avatar, going back to the very, very beginning, is who do I want to be? So I talked about that, but also who do I want to serve, which from the investor standpoint, my avatar is the busy professional. Like people like you, you're not my avatar because you've got the knowledge, expertise, experience, and network to find good operators and trust and invest directly with them. I'm looking for people in the oil industry, healthcare, and certain professionals that they just want to check. They want to like and trust me, look over everything, make sure it's good. And then beyond that, they just want to check on some reports, keep their money safe, keep it growing. Gotcha. The, okay, so let me make sure I recap this. So in a normal, traditional, close-ended fund, let's say it's a $10 million fund as an example, the fund manager will raise that 10 million. Let's say I have that year or two year window, raise that 10 million, and then go and source the property, identify the property to invest in, correct? And in a open-ended fund like yours, uh, since you don't have that time window, you can, as you're raising money, you can go and deploy it, raise more money, deploy it, raise more money. You keep doing that until you hit your either your 99 vessel limit or your $100 million limit. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Okay, very cool. And yeah, so when, when I saw you were doing the raise for that San Antonio deal, you guys just closed on. And the way that you did that where you, that's how I came to know about your strategy a little bit, understand your strategy a little bit more of, you you were advertising for that deal, for that raise. When I first saw it, I thought you were raising directly for the deal. And then when we chat a little bit, you're like, no, I'm raising for my fund, which would invest in the deal. I was like, ah, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know you could do that. That's a really cool way of raising money for funds, which makes it, I think, easier to raise money than in a traditional way where it's completely blind. People are investing into the funds just based off of your investment thesis. And then after that, you go and source the deals. For, um, so can can you share your insights into that? How has it been? Um, you know, how easy it has it been to raise money for your fund versus when you were doing it uh, yeah. outside of your fund? Yeah, it, it, it's hard to say 100% because we're also in a very like, like the, the market cycle right now, it's difficult just to raise in general. Unfortunately, for me, I started this fund in that cycle. Now I'm an optimist. So I'm like, Hey, look, I'm going to grind it out. And like when the market picks up, like I'm going to be like five miles ahead of everyone else. 
in general, raising for a, a blind fund is going to be a lot more challenging than raising for a specific syndication with identified assets. It's just makes sense. Like when people can look, see and touch exactly what they're going to be investing in, it's an easier process because in a blind fund situation, they're really not investing in assets. They're investing in the manager. They're investing in you because they're like giving their money to you and just hoping and trusting you're going to be able to do what you say you're going to do. Now, as assets get into the fund, it, it, it is an easier conversion. And that has been my thesis all along. Hey, once I get the first kind of rock foundational assets in the fund, that's going to tip over a lot of people on the fence or people wanting to say, or people that are saying, hey, let me know how it is. Let me know how it goes. Because I've gotten a lot of that over the last year. Every night, it was so much easier to raise money for like single family flips, and single family rentals. Now we're into like a blind fund. And it, it, it's been more challenging, a lot more challenging. This property now that we just closed, like I'm going, I'm, you can bet I'm, I'm definitely going to use that in marketing, showing that hey, look, we've done this. This is our track record. We've got this. Is what the reporting is, and like because we report monthly. This is how things have gone. These are how our short-term debt loans have gone. This is how the single family's gone. This is the overall blended return, and I'll be able to promote that to investors and give them something a little bit more tangible to to chew on, as opposed to give me your money and I'm just going to go out there and do this. It's just it's an easier conversion whenever they can see what you're doing because you've already done it. Knowing what you know now about this whole fund process and different types of funds that are out there, is there anything that you would do differently now? One, I would have done this a lot sooner. So there, there's that. On the open-ended versus closed-ended, I do not recommend anyone going open-ended unless they have a long-term um, vision. If you've got a long-term vision... And you got the ability to scale relatively quickly, the costs associated with it, and they're primarily accounting. You have a lot of legal costs too, and you're going to have that on both ends, but the accounting costs and the accounting mechanisms in place to facilitate that, it costs a lot. And I'm okay with that though. But I also, in this fund, I the financial modeling, I'm leaving a lot of money on the table and I'm okay with that. Because I've got two more lifetimes. So I say two more lifetimes. I live 41 years. I plan on living 120. So was that? One and a half more lifetimes. So I've got time to make up on that. It's okay that if I get investors in, yeah, I could have made a little bit more if I would have done things like a catch-up. I don't have that. I don't have a catch-up. Like we have PREF paid before asset management. It's mainly because I don't need the money. Like I've got income sources coming in. I'm, I had the ability to front load some of the costs and get that on the back end. Would I do that on the next one? The pref before asset management? Yeah, probably still, but I'd probably add a catch up. But otherwise we we have it structured now to where it's pretty favorable, pretty darn favorable to investors that that come in. Well, again, as long as we do what we're, we say we're going to do. You mentioned that with an open-ended fund, you have to have a longer term vision. Why is that? Like, why? It's just you... to make it worthwhile. Oh, because I see. Like, How much the, more the cost? Is, cost... Uh, th think about it. From a closed-ended fund, everyone's coming in at the same valuation, and no one's getting out. So th th there's no calculations involved in hey, how are you going to determine investor, you know, A, because they're getting out at year three, and then you've got other investors that got in at year two, like all these fluctuating value valuations of entry and exits. You don't have to mm. worry about those with a closed-ended fund. At least you shouldn't. Maybe there's more complicated structures out there I'm not aware of. But with an open-ended fund, you definitely do. Like a, a stock market makes it pretty easy because it's it's done publicly, and, but there's no depreciation in stock. So you don't have those depreciation tables are different for every single investor. An open-ended fund does. So I that's see. why, and there's been plenty of accounting firms that have told me, no, we just do not work with open-ended funds because it's so complicated. Interesting. Okay. I didn't know that. That's, yeah. So this, so with this accounting part of it, is that part of the fund management fee? Is it one firm that is doing all of this for you? Uh, or is it two separate firms, the fund admin and the accounting? How so does that work? part of our value proposition to investors outside of just the, the financials is third-party fund management. So we do that, which 
many, I don't want to say most, but many of the syndication opportunities that I've been a part of, they do not offer that. It's not that it's good or bad. They just don't offer that. They don't offer third-party fund administration, which means the accounting is, they're going to have more control over the accounting procedures. Nothing necessarily wrong with that, but the alignment of interests can be blurry. Um, I think Bernie Madoff. That wasn't blurry. That was downright uh, legal. <laughs> uh, but that opportunity to do that exists if you have greater control. I do third-party fund management. That way when investors get the reports, not from me, from the third-party fund manager, mm. that, I didn't make those. That's all based on it. They're looking at the numbers. They're doing the books and sent out monthly. And then beyond that, we have annual audits. And it's a different firm. So mm. it, it's two tr two layers of transparency that is done by independent third party vendors as a kind of a like trust but verify. Hey, I I hope every investor likes and trusts me. But at the end right. of the day, I also want them to know that the information I'm giving you, like you can like and trust me, please do. But beyond that, we're still going to be providing third party fund management, third party annual audits. So you can make sure that the reports that you're getting, uh, given have been seen through multiple sets of eyes and they were not made by me. Gotcha. Can you share how the fee structure works? Do they charge you a flat fee? Do they charge you based on how much asset you have under, a fund under management at any given time? Or how does the fee yeah, structure Yeah, I use work? NAV. They're the third-party fund manager. And they're, I was very cautious choosing them because they're the cheapest one. I interviewed a lot and they were significantly cheaper than the next one up. And then like that, that, that cost went up pretty high. And I'm just scratching my head. Like, why is this? Because in single family, especially with contractors and all this cheapest usually means the most expensive because you end up paying for the, fixing their mistakes. That was so cautious, but I knew multiple people that had used them and they had a positive experience. And so I ended up going with them, just watching. And overall, I'm pleased. I don't really have any complaints for them. I forget the exact structure. It is based on total assets under management. So I haven't hit that. I'm still at whatever their minimum fee is. But it, and then it'll scale up the larger fund you have. But they were probably 30 to 40% cheaper than then very, there's just the next one up which was a lot. I see. Overall, I'm so happy. Now on the audit auditing side, it's the same thing. Like how complicated is it going to be? How many transactions, how much funds, how many investors? There's a lot that goes into that. I haven't gone through the first audit, so I'll let you know how that goes <laughs> after the first one. Yeah. And then, so with NAV, they provide everything for you, right? The portal, uh, the fund admin. All they can the do the portal. I, I use a separate portal. I use invest. Oh, okay. Um, so okay. I had already been set up with Investnext with my other fund. Um, I like their user interface. So I stayed with them. NAV does have a portal. It's not, you can't, add, I mean, unless they've added this recently. Uh, the reason why I went with Investnext is because it's a one-stop shop from a portal onboarding experience. Investors can go on. They can look at your opportunity. You can have docs and everything uploaded. They can do the um, and investor or accredited investor verification right there on the portal. They don't have to, they don't have to leave the portal because they have a third party tie-in and then they can sign docs and they can even fund right there in the portal. They can connect their, you know, bank ACH and wiring uh, or ACH and, and they can fund all within the portal. They don't have to go anywhere. Anything you can do to streamline, reduce friction, anything you can do to reduce friction is going to increase the sale. Every, every point of friction increases the probability of at a bare minimum a slowdown but a fall off so i want to I, reduce and raising money is hard enough already make the friction make it as frictionless as possible once they're onboarded that's where nav comes in so yeah they do have a separate uh, portal within nav and but nav does the bookkeeping they do the distribution of k1s they don't create the k1s the cpa will but they'll distribute them they'll they have the the overall investment profile and breakdown of every investor and they're, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're the fund manager. Very cool. Yeah. It's an, uh, definitely an, uh, an exciting word to learn all of this uh, for sure. And which company are you using for the 
auditing part of it? Not sure yet. Um, I've got three or four that I'm talking to. So we'll, uh, yeah, over the next few weeks, we'll see. I did talk to the CPA or the attorneys about, do I even have to audit in the first year? We had relatively few transactions this year, especially compared to what we'll probably end up doing next year. I was like, if all investors are okay, deferring audit from year one to year two, is there a legal requirement? And the advice that I've received so far is no, they, they don't think there is. But going forward, yes, I would still need to. But in any case, yeah, not, not sure yet. I see. Is there anything that you have discovered about funds, fund management, like anything around funds that you, you know, that you were like, aha, or uh, that were like major insights for you that I haven't asked you about yet? The, the scalability. So I come from operations, from heavy hands-on operations, house flipping. And, but I was talking to my wife and I was like, hey, look, what we're doing now has outside of the occasional pop-ins and checking on things like going to visit properties, it can be done from anywhere in the world. Like we can be snow skiing and in the Swiss Alps, we could be hiking Machu Picchu or whatever outside of being able to handle communication and, and everything. I, the, there's no physical location requirements to do this job. And then the second thing is the economics favor hiring level tens. And that's a huge one for me. So you flipped houses, I flipped houses. The, the financial model of house flipping when you're trying to scale, at least for me and my experience, there's not enough room to hire level tens, it, it, at least to mm -hmm. fill all seats. No matter how you do it, in my experience, I was still integral to the wheel. Mm -hmm. And that meant there's always going to be friction on me. I'm going to slow the process down if I'm not always present at a, at a level 10. But the fund model, the economics are there to where I can hire level 10. There's still economics for me on the back end and it's sellable. Not that I would want to sell. Maybe, maybe later on, I don't really know. But the economics are there where we could hire a level 10 investor relations manager, a controller, a underwriter. And we can go out and we can hire really competent people and pay them well, and the financial model still works. Th yeah, that, that probably 100%. more so than being able to do it anywhere. I like that better because it's not reliable. Right. And I'm really excited about doing that. I was just, I was never able to make that work in flipping. Maybe someone else has figured it out. I'm sure someone has. I don't think the open doors have because they're still losing money, <laughs> but maybe someone else has. I, I just, I, I wasn't able to get there. Gotcha. And how do you make money as a fund manager? Um, asset management fee and then through the promote. Okay. And that, do you... Which really uh, the asset management fee, that, that, that goes to pay for the level 10s. I mean, right. That keeps the doors on and there should be some profit or there's profit in there too. But at least for the first five years, I'm not really expecting that to pay me much of anything because we're going to feed that revenue into business. But the promote is pretty significant. I see. Do you charge, you know, how in syndication we charge 2% a year as asset management fee? Is that the same we case one here with half. your fund? One and a well, half. One and a half. Okay, but it's junior to the pref. So we pay the pref, pref out first. Okay. And then and and then on the back end, is it like a normal 70-30 split, 80-20 split? What is that? We do 80-20. Yeah. 80-20 with no catch up. Okay. So okay. If I were to gotcha. do it again, I'd probably really do a catch up, but uh, again, you know, I've got time. Gotcha. All right, cool. All right. For, we're going to be wrapping up this uh, part of our show, but before we wrap, I do have another question for you. For those that are listening and wanting to start a fund and maybe they're brand new into it, how would you, what would you recommend them as whether resources or direction of where to go to, to begin to uh, learn more about funds? Yeah, learning for, for me, my advice on anything, whether you're going to learn, you know, how to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or starting a fund is be a sponge. That's what I did. I did that for a year. Hey, we were at the same, same event yep. in Vegas. 
And uh, my fund was largely ready to go, but I I put six to nine months of massive amounts of just being a sponge on Google and talking with people and all that to acquire anything that I could, not just from real estate, private equity, hedge funds, crypto funds, all this stuff. Be a sponge, figure out what you don't know. I love Ray Dalio's book, Principles. That was a really good book. The book by Stephen Schwartzman, the founder of Blackstone, was a phenomenal book. Those two books have a lot of parallels too when you read them. They're totally different books, but you'll see the overlaps, especially when it comes to mm. hiring. Back to the level 10s, that's how they were able to grow well because they hired level 10s. But and then also consider like, why do you even want to do it? Like, this is not a it's not like starting out wholesaling. There's real costs and it's not cheap. Like the, the legal when, when I first told people I started a hundred million dollar fund, they're like, oh, wow. They're like, oh, excited. I'm like, I just have a thirty thousand dollar piece of paper. <laughs> like, uh, I haven't done anything yet. Like, I appreciate it, but I haven't done anything. yet. <laughs> it's expensive. Figure out why do you want to do it? It may make sense to work with someone else, either for them directly do a JV, find a way to do that legally. It may make better sense to do that, to get your feet wet, to get in the industry and, and then grow from there. I don't know, maybe you figure out, maybe, it's better to know if you like it and you want to do this without committing 30, 40 grand or whatever in legal paperwork and then move on to something else than having that as a sunk cost. All right, uh, Chris, for those that wants to uh, reach out to you, connect with you, learn from you, invest with you, where would you want to send them? Yeah, investedx.com, invested with an ED, and then just the letter x.com. So there you can subscribe to, I do a weekly newsletter with market observations where we, I just share my thoughts on what's going on in the market, videos and interviews that we have recently, upcoming events, which we got a big one coming up soon. Real Estate Investing Fundamentals Masterclass. I don't, I, maybe it's out there, I'm not aware we're doing it for free. This is a five hundred to thousand dollar weekend boot camp. Like we're, just, I'm putting out there one hundred percent free, and we'll keep it for free. And it's ridiculously high quality. Sometimes I'm like, man, why did I commit myself to this? But I'm going to do it, and I'm really excited about it. So if you want to join me there? But yeah, investedx.com has all my socials and yeah, everything. I'm all over the place. Perfect. And one of these days, Elon Musk is going to hit you up and uh, invest in your fund. How about that? And I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll go for it. Um, fund. Yeah, that, that might be a colonization of Mars Investment Fund 1. <laughs> yes. Awesome. All right, Chris, thank you so much for doing this interview with me today. Really appreciate it. You've been a wealth amount of information. Love to dig into about this fun war. It's so, so exciting. Uh, so thank you so much for being on here today and sharing your knowledge with us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Awesome. <laughs>